Okay, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, I'm Julie Samuels from EFF. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today for our virtual boot camp for app developers. Um, I'm going to start off by making a little introduction and then introduce you to our four panelists and I will let them take it from there. So first I wanted to uh, start by saying that most of you listening today are app developers who've either been sued by LoadSys, received a letter demanding you take a license from LoadSys, or are simply and rightfully concerned that you might hear from LoadSys or another patent troll in the future. As you're all aware, LoadSys has been targeting app developers, claiming that they infringe its patents by using in-app upgrade and payment functionalities. Uh, in most cases, you also probably already know, app developers receive that technology directly from Apple or Google. Uh, we know that many of you listening today cannot afford a lawyer, um, so we'd like to help give you some general information to help make informed decisions on how to deal with LoadSys or other patent trolls. Uh, and this is important though, I really want to underscore this point. Everyone on this panel might be a lawyer, but no one is your lawyer. So that means that nothing anyone says is protected by any kind of attorney-client privilege or any other confidentiality protections. Since we are not your lawyers, we also cannot answer questions about what you should specifically do if you've already heard from LoadSys or even if you haven't. We can only give you general information to either make that decision yourself or with a lawyer. If you are interested in EFF's help in finding a lawyer, please email info at EFF.org. That's info at EFF.org. I should also say we don't have specifics about any agreements that LoadSys has entered into with any other app developers. That's most likely confidential between those app developers and LoadSys. Um, finally, we are not going to publicize any of your names or professional affiliations. If you want to ask a question, and we encourage you to do so, and are worried about remaining anonymous, please send your question via email to bootcamp at EFF.org. No one else is going to see those emails except for me. If you're not as concerned about remaining anonymous and are also curious about questions from others, go ahead and use the bootcamp hashtag on Twitter and direct your tweets to at EFF. So the hashtag, again, is bootcamp and direct the tweets to at EFF. Um, and, and we're going to try to answer as many questions as we can. A lot of you have already sent in some great questions. Unfortunately, we only have 90 minutes, so we'll, we'll get through what we are able to. Now I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to introduce the panelists in the order that they will be speaking, and then I will let them take it from there. First, we have Colleen Chen. She's a professor at Santa Clara Law School. She's nationally known for her research and publications surrounding domestic and international patent law and policy issues. Her work has been cited by the FTC and in Congress. She has testified before the Department of Justice, the Federal Trade Commission, and the Patent Office on patent issues. She's done some great articles and written empirical studies on the history and effect of patent trolls on the industry. Uh, next, we have Tony Patek, who got his law degree from UC Berkeley and clerked for Judge Edward Reed in U.S. District Court in Reno, Nevada. He worked previously with Cooley and the Bernstein Law Group, and he is currently the co-chair of the American Bar Association Subcommittee on Non-Practicing Entities, which is a new subcommittee of the Patent Litigation Committee. He is now a partner at the newly founded law firm of Helix IP LLP in Redwood City, a small firm dedicated to IP litigation and counseling. After Tony, you're going to hear from Andre Papavici, who has been working in the patent field since 1995 and started his own practice in 1998. Andre's areas of expertise include computer software, hardware, scientific instruments, energy, and medical devices, and he specializes in representing clients before the patent office. Finally, you're going to hear from Ben Singer, a partner at Dithavang, Mori, and Steiner. Uh, Ben has worked at Quinn Emanuel and Fish and Neve, as well as the District Attorney's Office in Massachusetts. He's litigated patent cases in California, Texas, Delaware, and the International Trade Commission. He was a member of the team named IP Litigation Department of the Year by the American Lawyer Magazine in 2010. I would personally like to thank the panelists for joining us today. I am so honored to have them here, and I know they're going to 
be able to provide you all with lots of uh, good and interesting information. So without further ado, Colleen. Thanks so much, Julie. And it's my uh, privilege to be here. And um, in my, uh, I'm, I'm really pleased. I want to mention, because we are talking about trolls, and you know, there are other polite names for them, including non-practicing entities, that I'm a non-practicing entity of sorts as well, as a patent law professor. So uh, more than probably any of the other comments commenters here, uh, you should take my comments as, as ones that are meant to just give you some perspective on the patent system and uh, where I see the troll issue kind of from my perspective, having done some empirical work on um, the different different uh, aspects of, of, of um, we have some issues with the, with, the, uh, with the video, but I'll just go ahead and speak. Um, uh, but anyway, so based on some of the, my different studies. So I want to try to do four things today in my presentation, and I just have basically four points to make. And the first point uh, I want to make is the Constitution, and I'll explain what I mean by the Constitution. Uh, the second point I want to make is that the patent system is unitary. And what I mean by that is that we have a lot of different technologies, and here we're in this conversation, and when we talk about trolls in general, talking a lot about tech and component uh, technologies, but the problem with the patent system is that it's meant to serve the entire of technology, all the different areas, large and small inventors, um, invent in different areas, biotech, um, high tech, etc. And so when we think about the patent system and why it is this, this way and uh, what are some of the issues with it, uh, it's also important to consider that there's other kind of sides to the story. Um, another point I want to make, point three, is uh, to question our, our calling them um, trolls. And uh, again, um, that's something that I think is now coming to the common parlance, but there may be a reason to think about trolls in another way. And so I'd like to talk about that as well. So the first point I want to make is about the Constitution and really what the purpose of the patent system is. So this is, you know, again, kind of thinking about what I do with my patent law students on the first day of class. Uh, they come in and we look at the Constitution. And so if we go back to what the real purpose of the patent system is, we see, if we look up if you want to do this, if you've got your trusty constitution by your bedside, I'm sure you do. Um, it's in Article 1, Section 8, and it says that uh, the purpose is basically to promote the progress of the useful arts by securing for limited times to inventors exclusive rights. So to promote the progress of useful arts is basically the whole kind of idea behind the patent system. And Abraham Lincoln put it in his own distinctive way when he talked about the patent system adding the fuel of interest to the fire of genius. So we kind of parse through the language of the Constitution. We can get an idea for, you know, even though you're not patent lawyers, you probably aren't going to be um, people who are studying it too closely, you can get a basic idea for what is the bargain that the patent system basically um, uh, makes between society and inventors. And, are, you know, what do we want out of this as a society? We want to promote the progress. We want um, inventions to come forward. We want them to be disclosed. Um, and in exchange for that, we give inventors this limited right, of, of, which is this exclusive right for a period of time. So that's the basic kind of um, patent bargain we talk about when we talk about the patent system. We get progress, inventors get this incentive of uh, uh, an exclusive right. But if we go through the language of that, then we can kind of feel and understand what are the requirements of a patent and what is the nature of the right that is actually provided. So we're talking about promoting not any old invention, but inventions that actually bring things forward, that are representing progress, that represent discoveries. And there we have the requirement that inventions actually have to be novel and non-obvious. So they have to represent some kind of improvement over the past. And it can't be just a small improvement, but it should be something that is non-obvious. In addition, the progress that is made has to be to a useful art. So there are certain kind of basic threshold for what can be considered useful or not um, that are pretty low, but at least we have a sense that we're not giving this privilege to just anyone. We're looking for um, inventions that are truly promoting the progress and are in a certain types of areas. Um, the other point about this all, though, is to say that what we're giving to inventors isn't, as you might think, in a... Um, in a, you know, if you buy a property, a piece of property, well, I get to be on that property, I get to inhabit it, I, this is my house, my domain. That's not what we're giving in a patent context. What we're giving others is we're giving the patent, patentee the right to exclude, the exclusive right. 
And so rather than a positive right, a right to be there, it's really a negative right. It's the right to exclude somebody else from being there. And so that's a bit of a distinction and a difference between thinking about patents as property um, and they don't function really in the same way in this particular uh, context. So given that, I think it just gives a, if we want to think about, for example, you know, you guys are probably, many of you writing applications for current and future iPhone versions. If we think about what about an iPhone is actually patentable, if, uh, because we've heard, the, I think, in probably in several contexts that there's many, many patents over iPhones, you know, up to a quarter of a million. Um, you know, the thing you want to think about, well, if we think about what we just heard, what about an iPhone is patentable? So, for example, if Apple comes out in their next iteration with some new features, um, which of those are going to be actually patentable? So, you know, kind of think about it. If we step back, they're talking about potentially having a larger screen. And um, if we're now looking on a, the particular slide, let's talk about the swipe on mechanism. Okay, is that something that's patentable? Sure, it's very useful. Um, it you know, represents progress in terms of when it came out. But if it's a you know, feature that's on the iPhone 5, but it's been out there before, it's not going to be uh, novel. Basically, it's already been out there. So that wouldn't be patentable. What about a larger screen? Again, it, it promotes visibility, and it's a feature that a lot of people would like. Maybe a, you know, a larger screen has never existed in this particular configuration, but that's a really small incremental improvement. Um, that is, you know, considered to be something that wasn't out there before, so it's not um, that it's been there before, this particular set of um, features all in one place, but that the screen um, is, is really a small improvement and therefore is an obvious one. So that wouldn't be patentable either. What about that the, the fact that the model is they're now coming in a silver model? Uh, that is an aspect of the phone that is not considered to be part of the useful arts. It would be considered more of an aesthetic choice. So that might be something that, um, even though is pretty cool, is not going to be patentable. Um, finally, if we think about the shape of the device itself, the chassis, you know, let's say they come out with a new kind of design that makes, it makes it easier for you to hold it. I actually do drop mine quite a bit. Um, and I would love it if they came out with this new feature to allow me to hold onto it and not uh, not kind of be clumsy with it. Um, that might be something that would be patentable maybe as a design patent. And for those of, those of you who uh, saw the articles about um, Steve Jobs stepping down and then the legacy of his patents, many of his patents were actually design patents. So they weren't over necessarily some of the basic functionality um, in terms of performance, but about the, the shape and the color and certain as aspects that can be protected in a design patent um, form. So that's kind of a basic, uh, you know, very, very high level um, broad brush representation of what the patent system is and who it's supposed to be working for. Again, we have a bargain here and we're trying to make sure that we get as a society what um, something back for what we're actually giving, which is this monopoly right to exclude others. I want to make another point now, though to change gears about the patent system. So we've kind of understood it from the very basic introduction what the patent system is. When we think about how it actually applies, the next point I want to make is that many technologies and innovators are out there, but we only have one patent system. If we go back to this example of the smartphone having 250,000 patents, that's one version of the world, and that's how the tech world kind of sees patents. There was a famous um, description of IBM early on when they started to acquire patents. In early on, um, one of the patent lawyers went into the CEO's office and they said, well, what's this whole patents thing about? And he had a, uh, he had a computer with him and it had all these p pieces of red and green tape on them. He said, these pieces of tape represent all the types of technology that we're using that are other's technology in our product. And that is kind of the reality of modern technology, that a lot of um, different inventions are embedded into a single device. So here we have an estimate out there of about 250,000, a quarter of a million patents on just one particular device. Contrast that to another wonderful invention, the invention of aspirin, which is now quite old. But when it came out, if you talk about drugs, we're talking about a lot fewer patents that actually cover the, the actual product. So maybe on the order of 10 patents, something over the molecule itself, over potentially the formulation. Maybe there's a patent over the process of making them. But there's a much more finite number of patents that are out there that cover this particular technology. And these may be considered equal in terms of their importance. 
And if we step back and think about what are the implications of having 250,000 patents on a, tech, on a product versus 10, they are pretty significant. If I want to find, let's say I want to make the next aspirin, what's already out there, I can kind of know uh, kind of that I can look for related technologies and be able to find those 10 patents. I can locate them fairly easily. Not only that, but the language that's used by those 10 patents is fairly consistent within itself because we're really talking about a more limited community of folks that are working on these issues in a more unified vocabulary. If there's an acetyl group or something, for example, in a, 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 um, a type of, of, um, of drug, then that's going to be an acetyl group. Compare that to a smartphone, which can be referred to in many, many different ways. And among these 250,000 patents, it is referred to in many different ways. So you're talking about um, an electronic device, a mobile phone um, uh, um, imp implement, a wonder device, an electronic babysitter. There are a lot of different ways you can try to characterize a smartphone. And so being able to find what patents are out there and be able to get around them is pretty much an impossible task. Um, so if you want to you know, try to avoid infringement, it's pretty much impossible. You just don't know what's out there. And I think that has some ramifications for the patent system as we see it. And you'll you know, start hearing, if now you're kind of following patent, the patent system more closely, you'll see that uh, just yesterday the Senate voted to pass patent reform, and it will be going to um, the president for signature fairly soon. And you're going to hear different perspectives about whether this is a good thing or a bad thing. And I put this slide up because I think this is true in, in many contexts, but in particularly in patent law, you hear people talking about, well, it's working just fine the way it is, or we need change. And they're really talking from their own experience about how it's working for them. And so when we talk about you know, why doesn't patent reform do anything to really help the troll problem, it's largely because the troll problem is seen as one that really only affects tech and component industries, it does not affect bio and other kind of more um, traditional types of technology. And so if you're going to, as I talked about before, we only have one patent system. So if you make a change to fix the troll problem, you might end up creating problems in other areas. And this is what's really stymied and prevented progress from going forward. So I just want to make that point as well. When you hear more about the patent system, just be careful when you see whose perspective is being, being represented because there is a pretty diverse and heterogeneous system that's, that's there. I want to move to my third point, which might be a little controversial for this setting, but we're talking here about troll boot camp. And I think there's one thing to think about in terms of what you actually call trolls. And um, I've, I've certainly used that word myself before and talked about what it really means and thought about it. and. Um, I think the reason that I, I find that it's, it's maybe not the most helpful term is because when we think about troll, we think of somebody who's um, kind of small, unsophisticated, and maybe unethical in their behavior, and you're really focusing on the ethics. Um, and I think what that obscures is that really for trolls, an another term somebody's used in the academic context is that they're really low-cost litigators. They're really more entrepreneurs. So they're really not, you know, there because they kind of are anti-innovation or anti-product you know, uh, product companies, but they're there for the financial um, benefits that they can reap, uh, they think, at a low cost. And they're not smallish. I mean, loads just look small, but as we've talked about before, their patents come from intellectual ventures, which has, among its investors, a lot of the very tech companies that are um, the ones that are, are, are being now in trouble because of these patents. Um, and they have universities and a lot of retirement funds actually invest in intellectual ventures as well. So they're anything but, uh, but unsophisticated. They have uh, large resources. They're not smallish in those senses. And what they really do is, I think, if we want to think about them from an economic rather than an ethical perspective, is try to exploit the kind of weaknesses in the patent system and also um, come up with cheaper ways to bring litigation. So. We have this call now with 60 or you know, hundreds of uh, application developers, and there's others who are potentially going to be implicated in the LOADSYS patent suit. That is involving a small handful of patents, but they efficiently bring litigation by naming many parties. They use the same venues. They use the same kinds of counsel, trying to capture efficient economies of scale. And they do a lot to reduce their own costs and exposure. So by putting these patents in a non-practicing entity, they're not vulnerable to countersuit anymore. And in that sense, they've really become kind of innovators in terms of litigation strategy and coming up with low-cost ways to assert patents. If we think about 
the patents that are out there, if we go back to the smartphone, who are they held by? They're held by a lot of big companies, as well as you know, individual inventors, and they're widely dispersed among a lot of sources. But finding which patents are infringed by what products is not an easy task. That's something that they've been able to do. And also, thinking about IBM or Nortel, one of these companies suing, well, obviously, Nortel is not going to be doing that anymore. Um, they have exposure. So non-practicing entities, I think, have been able to, um, to do that. Um, the last point I want to make with respect to not calling them trolls is again, if we think about them as entrepreneurs, um, that entrepreneurs are, you know, by nature, going to be looking for quick opportunities to make money, low-hanging fruit. And so, if you can raise their costs or raise their costs more than others are doing so, then maybe they'll move on to other easier targets. And with that, I will conclude. Thanks, Colleen. Um, and I think we'll go ahead and switch now to Tony, who's going to talk um, a little bit about some uh, general patent litigation. Strat or not strategies. He's not going to discuss strategies. He's just going to talk about patent litigation. Tony. Okay. Well, uh, thanks for everybody for, for calling in. Uh, I am now going to talk about litigation, which is probably the, 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 the aspect of this whole process that most of you are trying hardest to avoid. Um, and I just want to distinguish, uh, you know, there there's a difference between uh, patent litigation, which is stuff that's going on in a U.S. district court, and uh, re-examination proceedings, which are proceedings that happen before the Patent and Trademark Office. Uh, Andre is going to be talking about re-examinations. So everything that I'm going to be discussing with you is basically just stuff that's going on within United States district courts. Um, and I just wanted to put out there that litigation can actually come up in a couple different ways. Uh, one is, of course, the one that most of you are worried about is ending up as a defendant in a lawsuit where somebody is claiming that you infringe their patent. Uh, it is also possible for you to be a plaintiff in what is known as a declaratory judgment type of claim, which is a situation where you are essentially going to the, to the court and you're asking them to essentially issue an order clearing you from any risk of, that you're infringing the uh, the plaintiff, I'm sorry, the patentee's patent. Uh, so with that, um, I also just wanted to note, of course, the, the biggest reason that everybody wants to avoid litigation is that it's very expensive. Uh, a number that a lot of you may have seen put out there is that you know the average cost of a patent lawsuit is somewhere in the vicinity of $4 million. Uh, while that number is uh, accurate in a sense, I would just point out that that is actually a number for patent lawsuits where there's a lot of money at stake. Uh, in fact, that's for cases where there's $25 million or more at stake. Uh, the cost of the actual patent litigation correlates somewhat with the amount of damages that are being asked for. And uh, as the number of uh, the amount of damages at stake goes down, so does the cost of litigation, which is not to say that it truly becomes cheap. Uh, the numbers for cases where less than a million dollars in damages are being asked for are still in the $600,000 range, uh, which is a rather exorbitant amount of money compared to the amount of money that's at stake. Uh, so as you can imagine, uh, people tend to settle out of those small cases much more quickly. Uh, and of course, that's one of the main problems that's going on in litigation with non-practicing entities, uh, they're often coming in and asking for relatively low amounts of damages, and you're then stuck with a situation where it's going to cost you significantly more to litigate it than is even at risk in the lawsuit. And so from an economically rational point of view, there's really no reason to pursue litigation because you're still coming out ahead financially if you just buy a license. Uh, and that's a big part of the reason why a lot of people get licenses from non-practicing entities uh, as quickly as they can. Uh, and I'm not saying that's something that you should do, but I'm just saying it is a, an economically rational path that a lot of people do follow. Um, so uh, I guess then if you want to ask, you know, why would you actually bother to go through with any litigation as opposed to simply settling? Um, I'm just going to throw out there, I'm not, again, recommending this because I think it's a bit of a long shot, but there are a very small number of cases where people uh, litigate and then at the end you can ask for your attorney's fees 
arguing that's an, that it's an exceptional case and that the claims that were brought against you were essentially specious. Uh, and there are some decisions out there where people are awarded their attorney's fees. Uh, there was actually a recent Federal Circuit decision, uh, I apologize, I don't remember the name of it off the top of my head, uh, but it was a case where a non-practicing entity uh, brought some claims against a small company. Uh, there was a fairly trivial amount of money at stake. I, uh, I think it was under $100,000, although I should probably double check that. Uh, the parties, well, the, the party that was defending spent, I believe, uh, around half a million dollars defending the case. And at the end of it all, the district court, this was in the Western District of Washington, uh, basically sat down and looked at the claims, said that they were ridiculous, uh, said that the lawsuit never should have been brought, and that it was basically just done in an attempt to essentially extort money from the defendant, and they awarded all of the attorney's fees to the defendant in that case, and the Federal Circuit affirmed that. Uh, I haven't seen a lot of cases like that, but I think it's interesting to note that there is that case out there. So that is uh, another strategy that somebody followed. Uh, they, they gambled, and in that particular case, they won. So, uh, but other than that, uh, if you're going into litigation, uh, I guess then the question becomes, you know, if you're going to go in, are you going to go in as a plaintiff and file a preemptive declaratory judgment action, or are you going to wait to get sued? And there the big question is, um, you know, why are you going to make a point of incurring all the costs of litigation rather than simply sitting back and hoping that the patentee passes you by or perhaps that somebody else wins and knocks out the patents before they get around to suing you. Uh, and there are a number of reasons why you might go on the offense and actually file a declaratory judgment. Uh, and mostly what it boils down to is trying to get into a court where you have a better overall chance of success. Um, so as many of you may know, uh, a lot of the non-practicing entity cases are bought in the Eastern District of Texas, uh, and that is considered a relatively pro-plaintiff jurisdiction. Uh, on the other hand, uh, if you are uh, the person being accused of patent infringement, you're generally going to go and try and get into a forum somewhere else in hopes that you will have a better jury pool and a better chance of invalidating the patents. Uh, hopefully you will have a jury that is also, or an, and a court, that is more skeptical about the patentee's claims for damages. So even if you do lose, they may just get a lower amount of money from you. Uh, and then also, depending on the forum that you're in, you could end up in a forum where it's actually simply um, cheaper to litigate on a procedural basis, uh, either because the court has some rules that make the litigation go faster, or just for whatever reason, it's less likely that the case will drag out. And along these lines, you know, one thing that might happen is there are differences uh, among the forums in terms of whether or not uh, you might be able to get a stay if the, uh, if the defendant goes or somebody else goes and asks the patent office to take the patent into re-exam. Uh, and so just some statistics to give you a little bit of a feel for how this boils down. Um, so just looking at the Northern District of California versus the Eastern District of Texas. Okay, uh, as you can imagine, I mean, the Northern District of California is essentially Silicon Valley. Uh, there are uh, a lot of tech companies here. There are a lot of people here who are very familiar with software and high technology. Uh, and that is, gives you a very different jury pool from the one you have in the Eastern District of Texas. Uh, and where, you know, there's essentially no software industry in the Eastern District of Texas. And as a result, you, you see starkly different uh, results in the two forums. Uh, the Northern District of California, the uh, median damages for a case that goes to trial where the patentee wins is about $7.6 million. Uh, and that compares to the Eastern District of Texas where the median damages is $19.7 million. Uh, then if you have the situation where the patent has been taken into re-exam, uh, and I'm sorry for preempting you here, Andre, uh, but the, if, if uh, you're in the Northern District of Texas and the Patent Office 
uh, issues a re-exam order where they're saying that they think they might have made a mistake and they want to take another look at the patent, uh, you have an opportunity to have the district court stay the case, uh, which is essentially that's an order where they stop the litigation and they basically uh, put it on the shelf until the re-exam is done. Uh, and in the Northern District of California, uh, those types of motions have won about 65% of the time. Uh, in comparison, in the Eastern District of Texas, uh, only about one in four of those is granted. So you can see you have a much better chance of getting the litigation stopped in California than you do in Texas. Uh, then in terms of the overall win rate, <clears throat> uh, NPEs only win about 35% of their cases in the Northern District of Texas, uh, whereas they win about 54% in the Eastern, sorry, did I say Northern District of Texas? Northern District of California, uh, versus about 54% in the Eastern District of Texas. Uh, and that's for everything, that's all dispositions, both trials and uh, motions for summary judgment, which are essentially uh, motions where the court is saying before the matter goes to trial that the evidence is uh, essentially lopsided enough that it can decide one side should win without going to trial. Uh, and then it's interesting, uh, when you actually go to trial, uh, the, the non-practicing entity win rate goes up substantially. It's about 71% in the Northern District of California, uh, which is roughly equivalent to the 66% in the Eastern District of Texas. And so when you take that in conjunction with the overall win rate, where the, the non-practicing entities have a much, much lower win rate in the Northern District of California, uh, what the conclusion that I take away from that is that there are a lot of weak claims that get brought. And then in the Northern District of California, those get weeded out at the summary judgment stage uh, so that they don't end up going to trial. Uh, and then the ones that actually do go to trial are the ones that are left that are actually more meritorious, uh, where the, the, the non-practicing entity has a much better chance of winning. Um, so, uh, so that gives you an idea of why people would bother to go and uh, file for a declaratory judgment. Uh, and uh, just to give a little bit of background, uh, so as you, some of you may know, there are actually a number of people who have been accused of infringement or given you know, quote unquote licensing offers from LODSYS who have gone ahead and uh, tried to file declaratory judgment actions in places outside of the Eastern District of Texas. And uh, I would just note those, I mean, I don't know that there have been, uh, that many of those have gone through the pleadings phase, which is uh, essentially just um, the beginning of the, the whole litigation where the court's just trying to figure out if it has jurisdiction and if the plaintiff drafted their complaint properly uh, and so the court actually has power to go ahead and hear the case. Um, there was one defendant that actually filed in Chicago, which is I believe Northern District of Illinois, uh, and they did so because they had gone and found that uh, the CEO of LODSYS uh, had listed himself somewhere as living in the greater Chicago area. Uh, and so they went ahead and filed in the Northern District of Illinois thinking that they would have personal jurisdiction there. Uh, and then it later came to light that he was actually in Wisconsin, I believe. Uh, and so now LODSYS has uh, gone through and basically is trying to get rid of that declaratory judgment action, arguing that there's no personal jurisdiction in the Northern District of Illinois. Uh, and that original plaintiff uh, has refiled or has filed a second declaratory judgment action in Wisconsin. And there are a number of other plaintiffs who have also done so there. Um, and then I would also note there are a couple of people, I believe one or two who have filed in the Southern District of California. And I can actually, let's see. So yeah, so it was 4C results, uh, I believe was the, the and a few other defendant or, or companies rather were the ones who had done that Northern District of Illinois uh, declaratory judgment. Then there's ESET, which is also filed in the Eastern District of Wisconsin. Uh, and then another one in by Right Now Technology and then yet another by Wolfram Alpha. Uh, and I don't have, I'm sorry, I'm looking at my notes here. I don't have the Southern District of California case. I think I might actually have put in ESET incorrectly. 
uh, I think ESET might have been Southern District of California. Um, but in any event, that just kind of gives you a background for LODSYS in terms of what's going on in terms of people trying to get declaratory judgments heard. Um, Tony, can I quickly uh, read a question I've gotten? Sure. Um, can you quickly talk about what would happen if defendants can join together and maybe be in a litigation together? Sure. Uh, well, and so they're, I guess it's a little bit unclear to me whether they're asking if they can join together as plaintiffs and file a lawsuit all together, uh, which I guess they can. I think that's what Forsey and other peoples have done. Uh, basically, you know, anybody who has been accused of a legal wrong where, where the claims have similar facts and so that the basic interest of all the various parties are aligned, uh, they can join together and make what's called a joint defense group. Uh, it more often happens in an actual defense setting where they have all actually been sued and then they're all defendants and they're trying to coordinate their efforts. Uh, and that is a good way to cut down on litigation costs because you can distribute the costs among multiple parties. Uh, in a situation where there are one or two really big companies and then the other companies are smaller, uh, there's also frankly a bit of a free rider opportunity uh, in that you can just rely on the fact that the big companies are going to be pushing forward and spending money. And uh, that's of course what a lot of people are relying upon in the case where Apple is trying to intervene is they're hoping that Apple will come in and then Apple will be able to carry the water, at least on certain issues, to handle most of the costs of the, de the defense. And then everybody else can hopefully sit back a little bit. And I think I'm about out of time, so. But if, really quickly, speaking of Apple's motion to intervene, uh, you are almost out of time, but if you could just quickly talk about what a motion to intervene is and means and kind of explain what Apple's tried to do. Um, I think that would be helpful. Sure. So um, generally speaking in litigation, you're gonna have a plaintiff who comes in and sues a bunch of defendants. Uh, if you have a situation like this, I mean, Apple was not named as a defendant, but they have arguably a big stake in the litigation. So they want to be able to participate in the litigation. So essentially in their motion to intervene, they're arguing that they are a party with significant interests in the disposition of the case and who have uh, some legal standing to intervene and participate. And uh, so that's essentially what Apple is trying to do. And then if the motion is granted, uh, Apple will be able to assert various defenses on behalf of the defendants. And I would just point out, as many of you may be familiar, uh, Apple will not be able to assert invalidity defenses, or at least that's the impression that we all have. It's assumed that when they took a license, they waived that right. Uh, so they are simply going to be asserting their license as an exhaustion defense, essentially arguing that all of the developers are covered under their license. Great, thanks. Um, and then one last quick question about litigation that I think is pretty straightforward. There are a lot of uh, international app developers who've been who've received letters from Lotus and have frankly even been sued. So, really quickly, what happens if someone lives outside of the United States and either receives a, a and is sued, frankly, in, in right. court here? Well, uh, so of course the first question always in a lawsuit is whether or not the court has jurisdiction over the parties. So essentially whether or not they actually have the power to try the case and to enforce a judgment. Um, the, the, the real question is probably not where the defendant resides uh, so much perhaps as where they, whether or not they actually have a corporate presence in the United States. Um, if you have a corporate presence within the U.S., uh, the patentee is probably going to be able to serve you because you will have had to register in order to be served somewhere within the United States. So they'll just serve you there. And then the law on personal jurisdiction, uh, so whether or not the Eastern District of Texas can actually hear a case over an American company that is presumably doing some business within Texas, um, is pretty lax. Uh, there's been a movement to cut back on whether or not the Eastern District can hear some of those cases, and the Federal Circuit's been pushing on them to get some of those cases moved to other forums within the United States. But 
The simple fact of the matter is, if you are registered as a corporation anywhere in the U.S., there's probably going to be some U.S. court that can hear your case, whether or not it is the Eastern District of Texas. Uh, but there are some procedural hoops that they have to jump through. So if you aren't registered somewhere within the United States, so let's say you aren't a Delaware corporation, uh, but you're only incorporated in, for example, the United Kingdom, there are additional procedural hoops that they're going to have to go through in order to pull you into a case in the United States. Um, those procedural hoops can be gotten through, I believe, uh, but you know, you have to wait until you actually get a properly served complaint. Up until that point, the court doesn't have any power over you. Thanks. Thanks, Tony. And now we're going to move on to Andre. He's going to talk about re-exams. Um, I know people are really curious about re-exams because, as most of you know, Google's filed a re-exam on, on the two loads of patents that are uh, uh, at the heart of most of this debate. So with that, Andre. Thank you, Julie. Um, so I will not talk specifically about the Google re-exams, but um, I will talk uh, about re-exam in general. So I'll start with some terminology. Um, what are ex-party and inter-party re-exams? Uh, Google filed a kind called inter-parties. And then I'll talk about three topics. First, some numbers to provide you a better understanding of re-exams. Second, um, I'll go over some details on procedure and substance, uh, on the procedure and substance of, of re-examinations. And a, a little bit on the relationship to litigation. Uh, I think Tony has covered <laughs> a good part of that. And finally, I'll very briefly go over some of the uh, patent reform legislation um, that just passed uh, the Senate uh, yesterday. So, as Tony mentioned, re-examinations are proceedings in the PTO, in the United States Patent and Trademark Office, um, as opposed to court. Okay. Um, in an ex parte re-examination, the, the um, requester files a request with the Patent Office and then the process continues solely between the patent owner and the patent office. So the, the requester is out of it after the initial request. The requester can, in fact, keep going. He can file another ex parte re-exam request. And as long as that one can stand on its own, those re-exams will be merged by the PTO in certain circumstances. So there are ways to get around that. But typically, the requester is out. Um, the, an ex parte request can also be filed anonymously. An inter parties re-examination re request uh, allows the requester to stay involved in the process after the filing. So at every stage of the process, after the patent owner makes a submission to the PTO, the requester has a chance to, to uh, chime in as well. So let me give you some numbers. Um, this year, the PTO is on track to receive about 1,200 ex parte re-exam requests and about 500 inter-parties re-exam -re requests. Those, both of these numbers are up 50% from last year. So re-examinations are growing fast. Um, but they're not, those numbers are not that large. Let me put those in context. PTO will probably receive a little bit short of 500,000 patent applications this year, and they'll issue about 200,000 patents. And there are about 3,000 patent lawsuits filed every year, and maybe 100 of those go to jury trial. Um, so re-examinations, you know, a total of about 1,500. It's actually, there are fewer re-examinations than, than lawsuits. The PTO almost always agrees to start to re-exam. In over 90% of the cases, the, the bar is fairly low. For inner parties, it's 95% of the cases they agree to start a re-examination. And the outcome of most re-examination, I'll give you the more detailed statistics in just a little bit, is that most patents come out either completely dead or changed, changed in some way, sometimes in major ways, sometimes in more minor ways. So to, to get this picture a stack, and at the top of the stack you have a layer of, and those are the patents that emerged without any changes out of the patent office. This, that's a pretty thin layer. For inter-parties re-exams, only 13% of the patents emerge completely unchanged out of the re-examination process. The next layer down, those are patents that are changed in some ways. And for inter-parties re-exams, that's about 45%, a little shy of 45% of the patents that are re-examined come out changed. And the next layer down, those are the, those are the patents that don't, don't come out at all, that are completely canceled. For inter-parties re-exams, that's about 45% 
as well. Um, the middle layer, it's, it's hard to evaluate exactly what happens there. Those patents that do come out but are changed, the, the PTO doesn't break out those statistics um, to tell us was it a big change or a small change. But there is some indirect reason to believe that patent owners are generally not happy with the results, and that is that all, all the inter-parties re-exams that are appealed, they're appealed three to one by the patent owner. So for every appeal by the requester, there are three appeals by the patent owner. Um, so I'll give you some more numbers in this. I figure since we have uh, engineers on, on the call, you won't mind. <laughs> so Tony talked about the cost of litigation, and you can use cost as a proxy for the complexity of the, uh, complexity of the proceeding. And inner parties, the cost of um, an inner parties reexamination is a factor of eight or so less than the cost of litigation for cases with uh, under a million dollars at stake. So you're talking about a cost in the high tens of thousands of dollars. And then the cost of an ex parte re-exam where you just file the request and you stay out of it is another factor of eight or so less than that. So these are litigation, inter parties re-exam, and ex parte re-exams are, are almost an order of magnitude from each other in, in cost and complexity. They're, you know, th they are actually fairly different proceedings. So what happens to a re-exam when, um, when it's filed? It, it goes to a special place in the patent office. It's called the central re-examination unit. Some, some lawyers call it the central rejection unit. <laughs> this, is, this has about 75 primary examiners. These are experienced examiners. Uh, Two-thirds of them are in the electrical uh, field which, which covers software. And the cases have a, one examiner assigned to them, but it's really a team of three examiners that sign off on each office action. And the examiners don't have as much time pressure for their work. They don't have to crank out as many what they call counts um, in their, their jobs. You know, if you compare this to, to regular examination, in, in the normal prosecution process, you have about 6,000 examiners who get about 20 hours to examine a case. In, and some of them are junior examiners who you know, get their work reviewed by their supervisors but might have a couple of years ex of experience. In the re-examination unit, it's all experienced examiners in teams of three with more time. Um, after a request is filed, if the PTO finds that there is a substantial new question of patentability, and, and that's a fairly low threshold, they almost always do, they issue an order in about two months after the filing and to grant or, or deny the request to start the re-examination. And fairly shortly thereafter, um, a first office action on the merits follows. So for an inter parties re-exam, statistically that usually comes three months after the filing of the request. For an ex party, it's about six months afterwards. I saw a study where um, some attorneys looked at the rejection rate on this first office action on the merits for software or electronics inter-party re-exams. And they looked at the rejection rate by each examiner in that field. So they looked at, you know, how many claims are rejected out of the total number of claims that were at stake in the re-examination. And more than half of the examiners there have a historical rejection rate of 100%. They have never seen a claim they didn't reject at least the first time around. Uh, and many of them have um, fairly high rejection rates as well. So it's, you know, at least for inter-parties re-exam, it's, it's not easy to get your claims through at least at the, first, at the first office action stage. The applicant gets a chance to respond. They have to respond within two months. They can amend the claims or they can argue. There's a little wrinkle here, and, and that is if the patents are about to expire, you really don't want to amend your claims because um, once the patent is expired, you, you can only benefit from your unamended claims. You cannot. You can go back six years uh, to get damages, but you cannot change your claims going forward. So, with a with a patent about to expire, you're really going to be think very hard about even trying to propose any kind of amendment. Um, maybe I, I should clarify that uh, six years thing. Should I do yeah. that now? Okay. So, so say if, if a patent expires next summer in in 2012. Um, 
theoretically, the, the plaintiff, the patent owner, can sue up to six years later for damages that occurred up to next summer. So the, the, the clock on the damages stops, but the enforceability of the patents keeps going for six years. So a patent owner can, can look back six years to get damages. Is that right, Tony? Is that a good way to put it? Yes. Okay. The, the one caveat that I'm going to throw in there is uh, there are also marking requirements, or right. there are notice requirements in terms of when the clock starts. So for instance, for a method patent, the damages clock won't start until they actually notify you that you are infringing. So if they wait four years on that clock, right, I mean, you know, before they notify you, they're not going to be able, in theory, to go back the entire six years. Right, right. And if I may just quickly point out that if uh, an app developer has received a letter from Lodesys uh, that Lodesys believes that app developer is infringing, that is the kind of notice that Tony's talking about here. Okay. So, well, going back, so after the patent owner responds, they have two months to do it. If it's an inter-parties re-exam, then the requester ha has a month to also um, respond. And the patent office at that point issues, after reviewing uh, the material, they, they issue a second office action, which is usually final, which means that the patent owner doesn't really get as much freedom to amend their claims if they wanted to amend their claims or to submit evidence. Um, at that point, the patent owner can appeal to the Board of Appeals within the Patent Office and then on to the Federal Circuit. The PTO reports that the average time from start to finish of a, of a re-examination, that's from filing to an issuance of a re-examination certificate, is just a little over two years for an ex parte and a, just a little over three years for an inter parties. I would caution, though, that there's major, se major selection bias in those numbers because only the, the re-exams that have gone, that have been fast enough to get out of the system are counted here. So the, the real numbers for a contested re-exam that might be appealed is probably a lot higher than, than three years. So a contested re-exam that ends up being appealed yeah, may end up taking longer than three years. On the other hand, re-exams have gotten faster over the last couple of years. Uh, there are a lot more examiners doing this. Tony has talked about stays, right? Can you, um, will a judge stay a case? And the statistics he gave, I think, are, are very useful, right? 25% uh, of, of, um, of stay requests in the Eastern District of Te Texas are granted. I would just add that, that um, a stay request is more likely to be granted if it's filed early and if the patentee can get an injunction. At least that's my understanding of the factors for granting a stay. So what are some differences from litigation? A major one is the, the way claims are construed. So the meaning the claim terms are given in the patent office versus litigation. In litigation, uh, if there is a disputed term, pick your favorite term out of a claim, and this, there's disagreement about what that means, a, the judge interpreting that claim term is much more likely to look at the specification and, and interpret that claim in a narrow way than the Patent Office. The Patent Office uses a different standard for claim construction that they call it the broadest reasonable interpretation. And if there are multiple plausible terms, as long as the spec hasn't excluded one of them very specifically, the PTO will say that you know, all, of these, all of these meanings of the term are plausible meanings and any kind of prior art that comes within any one of these meanings is going to be good against um, uh, against that claim term. The, the wrinkle here is that, and this is a funny, uh, funny situation, if the, once the patent has expired, actually the PTO shifts back to the court style interpretation and to original claims. So if you've made any changes or relied or, or uh, the re-examination proceeded on this broadest reasonable interpretation standard, on the PTO standard, it all switches back once the patent expires. There's no presumption of validity in the PTO. PTO examiners are, you know, engineers, they're technical. Um, it, that's different from, say, a judge or a jury. There is one downside to having an inter parties re-exam, and that is if you go to the PTO and you lose, you might not be able to raise the same arguments or arguments you could have raised in the PTO if you later go to court. And that's one of the downsides of inter-parties re-exams. 
I will end with very a brief, a few words about patent reform. Most of the changes I'm about to talk about, I'm, I'm about to talk about, are going to kick in about a year from enactment, so they will not be relevant right away. But re-exams will be decided in the future by panels of three administrative law judges that, rather than examiners, and I expect that might make it even harder for patent owners to survive a, a re-examination with their claims unchanged. Uh, there's a new, um, a new, new type of re review called post-grant review that will be available for nine months after the issuance of the patents. And inter-parties re-exams will get harder to start and they'll have more limits on them, but I, I won't go into the details of that. I do have one quick question that I'd like to quickly raise, and that's what happens if the court if there's a litigation pending and a re-exam, and the court does not stay the litigation, so both proceedings are moving along on parallel tracks, and then the patent comes out of the re-exam different, potentially narrower, what effect does that have if the litigation is almost done, or maybe even the litigation is done? Well, so the, the first question you'd have to ask is whether or not the disposition and the re-exam was final. And that means not only that the, the, the re-examiner has gone in and issued a finding, but that all of the appeals on that are done. And I would point out that can take a really long time. You can be looking at like six to eight years for all of that to happen. Um, but if it were final, then that would essentially, it, I mean, the, the court I think would be forced to uh, go back to square one. I mean, it's not gonna be able to issue any kind of of order of you know finding of infringement on a bunch of claims that are no longer actually in force um, because the re-exam if it's final will have completely abrogated the original claims um, on the other hand the claims the original claims are not actually void until the re-exam is final so if there's something that happens and that re-exam proceeding is still going on either because no uh, you know, final disposition, I'm sorry, no disposition has been given by the, the patent office or because it's still an appeal, whatever, um, then the court could, in theory, just go ahead and give a disposition on the merits for the original claims that were filed. Uh, and, you know, that's just one of those things. I think it's in the discretion of the district court judge. So depending on where you are, you might or might not uh, be able to convince the judge to hold off on doing that. And sometimes in that circumstance, the parties will work together to resolve the mess. They both have incentives to not litigate some unknown question that may or may not matter. I think the really key point that we touched on a little bit, um, but may not have been perfectly clear, is if the claim comes out changed, then the patent owner gives up the rights to any damages on the claim that they changed until that time, right? So that's the idea with why you wouldn't change a patent that's close to expiring, because if you change it, the clock can't start until the change happened. Anything before the change happened, they surrender. Um, and so that's also why you wouldn't litigate a claim that there was no damages to. Um, I've had that situation once, and it just worked out that it made sense for the patent owner to stipulate to get through the uh, appeals process, and it made sense for the defendants to tolerate an amended complaint. Um, and the really tricky thing comes up with the Markman order, but I won't even talk about that. <laughs> and that is actually a perfect segue because that was Ben Singer, our final panelist, who's going to talk a little bit about licensing. Um, but I, I really want to be clear that I we can't answer any questions about your particular situation or give you any advice about what kind of terms you should or shouldn't enter into. Again, I've said this before, I'll say it again. If you want help finding a lawyer, let us know. We can try and help you. Uh, info at EFF.org. But uh, I think that Ben's going to be able to offer some, some good uh, lessons on how licensing in patent context works. And I um, just would point out, too, that Relevant to what we were just talking about, Ben, if you could eventually get to talk about what would happen if you entered a license and then a patent came out of re-exam later. Um, I don't know if you were planning to mention that, but I think that's relevant to this past conversation. So without further ado, Ben. 
So, yes, Julie has us all on wired chairs, and if I stray into giving you advice, I get zapped. So uh, that will keep us all protected. Um, so I do all litigation, and what that really means is I do licensing. Um, 98 or 99 percent of federal court cases end in a settlement. Settlement means a license. Um, so. Uh, more and more, that's where everything's going, and as Tony mentioned, particularly in the non-practicing entity context where uh, the words we use is the nuisance value outpaces the demand, you're just headed for a license unless you have just decided uh, you, know, you want to be the irrational actor and you want to fight on principle and spend your money to wage that war, which sometimes happens and makes lawyers particularly happy because we enjoy fighting. Um, so, I have three quick points. I'm going to try and give very practical information. Um, what is a license? When might you want a lawyer? And some very high level ideas about how a license negotiation happens. So, a license is a right to use another's protected property. Um, I think a lot of people think it's something that isn't part of their daily life, but it actually is. A movie ticket is a license. A lift ticket at a ski mountain is a license. Take the movie theater, for example. They have a right to who gets to view their content. You pay a little bit of money, they give you a right. Um, and actually, the right is more specific than you may think. You're entitled to stay for one movie. You're entitled to one chair. You're supposed to see the movie you bought the ticket to, although I don't always do that. Um, so that's a license. Same thing with intellectual property. It works a little bit differently, but that's the gist. Um, Julie sent me some questions beforehand about what can be in a license, and for our purposes here today, I think you should think of it as essentially anything, right? It's a, it's a contract. There are rules to what can be a valid contract, but as long as uh, two people have a meeting of the minds about what deal they want to strike and the deal meets some very simple, low threshold rules, we can have any deal we want. I literally mean I can let you ride my giraffe for a week if you give me a right to use your patent for that week. Um, and so it's very broad. Um, with that understanding though, what are some of the key terms that appear in almost every license? Well, one term people are probably starting to get used to is royalty. Um, a royalty is, I guess, a fancy word for how you're going to pay for the right. Um, <clears throat> there are two very common types. One is a running royalty. That means uh, you pay me 15 cents for every widget you sell. Another very common type is a fully paid up royalty. You pay me a million dollars and you're free to use my technology for forever. Um, I think one distinction I want to draw is even though we sometimes call it a royalty, when you're talking about making a payment for something you've already done, past activity, it's really a release. Um, I'm, you give me some money and you're get buying the right that I won't sue you for things that you already did. Um, so also with the royalty, well, I'll come back to that actually, but so let's talk about uh, licensing in the context when you've been sued. Uh, if you've already been sued, then a very important part of a license is the dismissal. There are two types of dismissal. One is without prejudice. One is with prejudice. Um, without prejudice really is not much of a dismissal at all. It means they can sue you again. Um, with prejudice means that those claims are now barred. So of course from a developer standpoint, uh, with prejudice is preferable. I haven't entered a license where there was a dismissal without prejudice in maybe ever. Um, unless I wasn't paying anything and it was just to go away. So uh, another very important aspect of a license is what we call its term. Is it for a year? Is it for five years? Is it until the patents end? Um, you want to pay attention to that. Another important aspect of a license is the field of use and its scope. Um, and so, well, let me take those in separate. Field of use, uh, in this case, is going to be fairly well focused, right? But I think um, what I have in mind there is, are you, if let's say you've developed an app for the iPhone, does your license cover only the iPhone or should you expand to uh, the Droid platform? Would it still be covered? That's the field of use. Um, and its scope uh, th covers things like 
how many patents? Is it for one patent? Is it for both patents? Is it for a broader portfolio that um, might be available for licensing in connection mm -hmm. with this case? Would it cover things like uh, continuations in part or divisionals that issue from the applications that became these patents? Would it cover claims that come out of a re-exam? Um, so you want to focus on those things. I know that's a lot of information, but uh, that's sort of a you know two inch deep summary of what a license can be. So, uh, do you need a lawyer? Is a lawyer a good idea for you? Well, I'm a lawyer, so I'm biased, um, of course. But I think that in any time, any circumstance where you're going to enter a contract or you're going to have a litigation, of course a lawyer is useful to you. Um, in the same way that if I'm going to fix a problem under the hood of my car, a mechanic is useful to me. Does, are there exceptions? Sure. Uh, there are a lot of times when a person can't afford a lawyer, so it's not a choice for them. But even let's say you could. Um, <clears throat> you know, my understanding of sort of the universe of app developers is there may be some people who are actually, uh, you know, the front man for you two and have just happened to develop one app in a kooky night and that app made them $20. Uh, with $20 at stake, is it ever useful to have a lawyer? Probably not, certainly not cost effective. So you need to sort of think about who you are. If you have had many apps, or you plan to have many apps, or you have had one app that made a gajillion dollars, then I would suggest that considering hiring a lawyer before entering a license agreement is a good idea for you. Um, having a lawyer consider a license agreement is not a cost that's on the same scale as litigating. Um, just to give you an off-the-cuff estimate, I mean, I have clients that have decided they would like to take a license. They've even received a license that the other side would like them to enter into. And to get that license reviewed and shored up and negotiated and executed can be anywhere from three to five hours of time. Um, so if you're talking about making payments under a license that have five figures, you may want to spend one, you know, four figures with a lawyer to make sure that um, what you get for your money is what you need to protect your business. So negotiation. Um, well, it's like any negotiation, and particularly small business owners are used to negotiating. Although in some ways, just like with the contract for an app on the iPhone where Apple dictates most of the terms to you because there's such a disparity in leverage, uh, sometimes in a situation like this, you're going to face the same thing. Uh, but setting that aside, let's assume that it's um, things are up for negotiation, things are debatable. Then what is a negotiation? Well. In every license negotiation, the licensor wants to sell the smallest possible bundle of rights for the biggest possible pile of money. And you want the biggest bundle of rights for the smallest pile of money. Um, that's sort of a gross oversimplification, but it will work for today. Uh, so what I think of it as in a little, I think it's fair to clear, classify it as essentially a war of information. Uh, they want information from you, you want information from them. The difference is uh, they're going to have a very good feel for when they're obligated to give you information and when they're not, and you won't know those kind of things. So I want to try to level that out a little bit. So first, what kind of information is important to a patent owner in getting the best license and achieving their goals? They want to know how much can you afford to pay. They want to know your financials. How much have you made? They want to know your plans. What amazing app are you going to drop next? Um, and so what do you want to know from them? Well, what's the cheapest license they ever gave? Um, and things like that. So I want to, uh, there was one question about you know, kind of going over things on the phone versus in writing and how that would be how that would affect the outcomes. And I think that's really up to each individual party. But I will give you some ground rules. For one, you're under no obligation to answer any questions. And that's really an important thing. If, if I have, um, 
if you're you know the world's most skilled negotiator then oftentimes the game is well let's reveal the minimum amount of information that we want but shield everything else if you're not a skilled negotiator a better rule is don't say anything um, you don't have to and that's weird right I mean my wife comes home and says what did you do today I say I'm not talking about that um, but here this isn't about being polite it's not about making friends it's a different social norm you're under no obligation to answer questions you may not ultimately be able to get to a license without eventually doing some of that but you want to take your time and be sure before you say anything um, the next ground rule is don't commit right you're free to hear them out and always say I'll consider it I'll think about it I want to talk to my attorney I want to uh, sleep on it whatever it is you should be very clear and frankly you know lawyers are relatively good at pressuring without really seeming like they're pressuring so um, you may even say I don't want you know I'm not committing now or I don't want to discuss that now more than once and you may be asked again you need to feel comfortable to stand your ground and once you have some information from them you can consider back to my second point of whether or not a lawyer is for you um, so that's really all I had in in my outline I sort of anticipated maybe my window going last would get short but I will add one thing to the concept of a re-exam and there was one question about well what if the patents expire and it's you can draft a uh, license that covers any of that I recently did a license where we said well we'll pay you uh, making the numbers up but we'll pay you fifty thousand dollars but we'll pay you twenty thousand today and if your patent comes out of re-exam with even one unchanged claim we'll pay you thirty thousand that day and if it doesn't you forgive that thirty thousand um, so you can structure it however you want the one thing I will say is there are patent misuse rules and so to the extent that you end up with a running royalty arrangement um, you should only be paying until the patent expiration date. So just one thing you might want to comment a little bit more on with respect to taking your time to respond. I know there are a lot of developers who look at the 21 day time limit that's in the LODSYS letters and so maybe you just want to comment on, <laughs> I mean that's not well, enforceable but also just general experiences in terms of how long actual discussions usually go on for. Well, to take a step back too, if I may, um, I, I think Tony makes a really important point. Uh, there's no legal obligation to respond to a letter. There are strategic reasons why you might want to, but the letter from Lotsis isn't a lawsuit and you don't legally have to respond. So with that, Ben. Well, when I, I mean, can speak to it from, so first of all, there's Tony's point that the 21 days is a number that they gave you. I can only speak to what it means from personal experience because I do work on both sides of the fence. And so when I write a demand letter, do I always include a time frame? Sure, otherwise I have no expectation I'll ever hear back. Um, but do I always enforce my time frame? Is that written in stone? I think one thing I can say about that is that if I have or if you are cooperating, you're participating, we're hand in hand heading down the path towards a license, I have no incentive to go forward and sue you. It cost me money and one, you know, when I was a first year associate, uh, one of the very senior partners said to me that litigation is like dancing with a bear. Once you start, you don't say when you stop. Um, and so <laughs> everybody involved, they want a license and so if you're interested in a license, you can probably get there. I think it is important to, that's maybe one of the strategic reasons for at least responding to the letter. Um, oh geez, I got your letter. I, I'm interested in talking, whatever it is, right? Because if, if, you, if you're at least engaged and cooperating in a process, then that process buys you time. Um, but I will give the caveat that there are a lot of things about this case that don't fit a traditional norm, right? Um, and so we, I won't try to guess or promise what it is that LODSYS or LODSYS will do. Um, it's really, it's kind of a unique situation. I, you know, I think one of the things that is important to sort of get a feel for is if 
you know, if you have an app, it may be that they don't know, but if you have the most popular app and it's sort of, you know, public knowledge that it's a very successful app, then you're probably on a shorter leash for how long you have until you respond to the letter, right? If you're sort of someone that they don't have a high value expectation from, you may have a longer leash. Um, I mean, I asked a few people in response to a question that came in about, well, what if you just do nothing? Um, and we haven't really completely touched on that. And so let's say you did absolutely nothing. I just want to make sure people understand this. If you do nothing, and let's say you haven't been sued yet, you do nothing, you're probably going to get sued unless something shakes out first. If you already have been sued, you're already in that boat. What happens if you do nothing? Well, there's going to be a default judgment entered against you when you don't appear at a certain time. And a default judgment will entire, entitle the plaintiff to get reasonable penalties or damages from you. And one of the people asking the question said, well, what if I don't have any U.S. assets? Well, if you don't have any U.S. assets, it's very difficult to enforce a default judgment against you and collect anything. But don't forget, you could also have an injunction enforced against you. And that is the kind of thing where an injunction can be enforced on your app through Apple. That's a good point. Uh, so there is actually... Uh, there is a rule called Federal Rule of Evidence 408 that controls, um, controls, I, it's really not, it's really a, a relevance standard, right? It's not, um, what I guess is a legal sort of splitting of hairs, but there are rules in the evidence code that prevent um, <clears throat> negotiations from becoming part of a litigation if you've already been sued. So what the idea is creating, uh, if you will, a trust tree, right? We want people to be able to get to a deal and we want to create an environment where they can say the things they need to get to a deal without worrying about um, those things coming back to bite them in a litigation. So, for example, you may be, a patent owner may be demanding a hundred million dollars and we may have a negotiation where I say I'll settle for two. If we don't, as long as we take the right steps to protect ourselves, labeling things Federal Rule of Evidence 408 and if we had a mediation agreeing that it's under 408, then you wouldn't be allowed at trial to say, well, he can't ask for a hundred million, he was willing to settle for two. Um, if there's more... I probably could have been more complete with that, but whoever. So if I may, I actually just wanted to go back and make a correction to some of the statistics that I cited. I just realized I misread them off of my notes. Uh, and just going back to the question of what the win rates are for patent cases in the Northern District of California and the Eastern District of Texas. Uh, so I think I quoted before the overall win rate in the Northern District is 35%. Um, if the 71% number that I had quoted was for all cases that go to trial. I think I had characterized it as NPE cases that go to trial. That was not right. It's all cases that go to trial. Um, if you limit the subset to cases brought by NPEs only, uh, their win rate is only 25%, which is lower than the general win rate, which kind of supports the idea that NPEs are going to do worse in the Northern District of California than they would, than a general patent plaintiff would. Um, and then I would just note that the win rate for NPEs in Eastern District of Texas is 55%, which is actually nearly identical to the 54% win rate for all parties. So, Great. Sorry. I think we're going to go ahead and take some questions. Well, I've already gotten a bunch of questions, but I'm going to ask them to the panel. Um, the first question is, um, we talked earlier about how there's prior art and, and there are other patents that, that might um, inform an app developer what is or is not infringing. And so if an app developer wanted to make a new app, could he or she uh, find those patents themselves? Where would they go to do that? 
I think you get back to the issue, this is Professor or Colleen Chen, of the difficulty in tech of, of really being able to isolate and, and, and do this type of work. So we call these freedom to operate searches, and they are done in certain industries, but I think the idea here is if you thought about what am I doing that's new, has this been done before, um, it's, it's a pretty difficult thing to do. If you were able to you know, hypothetically come up with the language and be able to search you know, kind of everything, you would be looking at the old patents, but you'd also be looking at everything that's out there, so stuff on the internet, or, and I'm not kind of recommending that you necessarily do so, but anything is really fair game before your kind of date of thinking of the invention um, of, you know, kind of your new app. So um, all of that before, stuff that's come before is relevant. <laughs> and what you'd be looking for is not only stuff that's exactly like what you've been doing, but also that would be close to it, that would be, um, you know, the same idea, again, to, putting two things together and then those two things being in your application, those would be considered relevant as well. So, and just to follow up on that, I mean, we didn't really talk a ton about substantive patent law in terms of um, validity, like anticipation and obviousness, which are uh, you know, hurdles that patentees have to overcome in order to have a valid patent. Uh, we really didn't discuss that in any detail. Um, but when you're going out and you're doing a prior art search, I mean, just to follow up with a little bit more detail on what Colleen was saying, I mean, you're basically going out, you're looking for two types of things. I mean, one is generally speaking, um, like stuff that was out in the public domain before the patent was filed for that is exactly what was claimed within the patent. And that's the kind of stuff we would usually talk about as being anticipatory or raising a prior sale bar or something like that. Uh, and then there's their obviousness questions, which is just, you know, even if what the patent claims is a little bit different from, the, from what was out there before, is that, that little difference so trivial that we're not going to give them patent protection anyway. Um, and the whole comparison of whether or not something that you find is going to be anticipatory or obvious is really involved and frankly I think is probably hard to do for a layperson uh, because there are a whole bunch of subsidiary steps. I mean you have to go into the patent, you have to do what's called construing the claims which is you know trying to figure out what the legal interpretation of the claims is and then you have to go and compare that to all the prior art uh, and that's a lot of work. Um, now having said that there are I think some interesting new uh, resources out there that people can rely upon if they're looking to, to do things in a more cost-effective way. Uh, one, I'm going to blank on the name now, I think it's called like Article, Article one. 1 Partner. Yeah, which I, I have not used personally. I've heard very good things about them. That it's essentially a company that does sort of a, a bounty search method. Uh, you know, they basically offer whoever comes up with prior art that will knock out this patent, will give you X amount of dollars. Uh, and apparently the patent searches that come out of them are pretty good. They, Article One Partners has uh, put a call out for prior art on the Lotus patents, as a matter of fact. Yeah. So. Uh, and and I, but just one uh, clarification, uh, I think this is good advice from Doni, but the one thing to think about is if you're actually just talking about, I want to make my application, I just want to see what's out there so that I can minimize my risk, then you're really just looking at patents and you're not looking to invalidate, which is a distinct issue from trying to invalidate a patent that's being asserted against you. So if you're looking for, you know, I want to make this and I want to try to minimize the harm of, uh, or the risk that I'm going to be um, sued, then you'd be looking at patents. And Google Patents is a better interface than the PTO website because you can, this, the searching um, algorithms obviously will work a little better. But then, you know, again, the issue is how do you actually figure out what terms you'd search for? It can be described in many ways. For example, right now, the, when we're talking about for the Nortel patents that have been bought um, recently to try to cover the next generation of, of um, wireless communications, they're talking about pager patents. Okay, so these are pager patents were written years ago over old technology, but they're written in such a way that they're so broad that now they cover new stuff. So that kind of just explains or gives an example of how difficult it is to know what you might be infringing. I thought the question was a little bit confusing too in whether it was how do I bust patents or how do I get freedom to operate. So, I, But the one thing, and I know this sounds backwards, I just want to make sure I layer on top is if you go looking in a freedom for operate, freedom to operate situation, and you find a patent 
Remember earlier we were talking about the concept of notice? Well, you've just provided your own notice, and you may have stepped into something called willfulness. So um, it is, I'm not saying it's always better to just go blind, but uh, you should appreciate that there are risks when you have a product you're developing to taking on that kind of work yourself. Or, or for that matter, hiring a lawyer to go do it, since if the yeah, lawyer definitely. finds it, you're in pretty much the same situation. I'm glad you just said that because I've seen some questions about hiring a lawyer, um, and more broadly, number one, if a party could actually defend itself in court without a lawyer, and <clears throat> number two, what kinds of services would it make sense for an app developer to ask for in a lawyer if maybe an app developer hasn't been sued yet? Well, can you defend yourself? I mean, there's two aspects of that. One, is it a good idea? And two, is it legally okay? Yeah, it's legally okay. And in fact, it depends what judge you have, because there are judges that will give a pro se defendant a lot of leeway, understanding that you don't know the rules. There are other judges who will just be very angry that you've slowed down and confused their courtroom where they're already overburdened and will throw the hammer at you. Is it a good idea? I don't really think so. but. Um, it's only a, it only is a choice if you have the money anyways. If you don't have the money, um, then sometimes that's what you need to do. The firm that I work at is a full service firm and we work with a lot of um, startups. And so we have a bunch of former PTO judges, we have licensing specialists, and we have litigators. Um, and so with respect to the services we provide to people like app developers, we have a client now who's one. Um, well, oh, apparently a corporation can't go pro se. Good, good point. Um, so, but in terms of the services we provide, we'll do what you're talking about. If you want information about a freedom to operate, we do those kind of searches and report back. If you get a demand letter from someone, we do a similar search and may or may not do an opinion letter uh, that would then fix a potential willfulness problem. And a lot of what we do is we'll get you your own patent so that after something comes out, uh, someone can't just copy it. And in smaller situations, the value of a patent is also cross-licensing. All right, we've just got time for two more <coughs> quick questions, unfortunately. Um, I've gotten a lot of great questions. I wish we had all day, but we don't. So the first one, Ben, this is on licensing, and I actually think you talked about this some, but I just kind of want to make sure we're clear. This is actually two questions, but they're related. Um, do licenses apply internationally or just nationally? And someone asks, if I sign a license for a certain royalty rate, can LOTSIS then change that rate? I'll start with the second one because I understand it better. Uh, you know, if you commit to a deal at a certain royalty rate, unless the deal has escalation clauses, that will be the royalty rate. Um, it's becoming more and more common with the NPE situation forcing creative solutions for there to be escalation clauses. Um, but if it doesn't say something like, well, in two years it goes up, or if I go from three apps to five apps it goes up, if it doesn't say something like that, they can't just um, revisit it and change what is the royalty rate. It's a, it's a contract. Um, the national, international, I'm not sure I fully understood the question. So, so there, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm going to interpret the question as one of if you get a license and it offers you, you know, worldwide rights to operate under the patents, um, it depends a little bit on what it is they're licensing. I mean, a U.S. patent is only enforceable within the United States. You don't need a license to a U.S. patent to do things anywhere else. Uh, on the other hand, there may be other patents in those other places that do control your right to practice the claimed invention there. And you know, if they actually have patents in those countries, you can bundle those into the license and you can get a license to those as well. And then in theory, I suppose you would probably be paying royalties on sales in that jurisdiction as well. Um, but of course, the threshold question there is whether or not they actually have patents that are in those other places. So for example, could LOTSIS come and give you one license that covered both the US patent and any UK patents? Yes, they could. Do they have UK patents? Uh, I don't know. If they do, I haven't seen them yet. 
You know, the one thing we didn't talk about yet that's probably pretty critical to this is the concept of exhaustion, mm-hmm. right, with Apple intervening and what that means. So if go somebody ahead. wanted well, to Let talk, me really quickly, go before you no, go there, that's... I do want to talk about that quickly, but okay. I, I just want to, what uh, Tony was just talking about is relevant to another question I just saw, and I'll quickly say that, that it's important that U.S. patents are only enforceable in the U.S. So if you do not sell your app, in the U.S., either in the App Store or in the Android Marketplace or wherever, um, Lotus can't accuse you of infringing its U.S. patent. Um, That's just in response to another question that came over. So, um, uh, Ben, if you'll go ahead and quickly talk about exhaustion, which, to be clear, is the um, theory, or uh, Colleen's going to talk about exhaustion. Um, Someone is going to tell you a little (laughs) bit about exhaustion, which is the theory under which um, Apple is alleging that the app developers should not be liable for any infringement of Lotus patents. So the idea of exhaustion is basically a rule against double dipping. Once I have my patent, I can use it to get royalties against somebody, but then I can't go ahead and then ask that person later again for more royalties. And the way it comes up in a patent context might be um, I, I sell a patented product, I have that patent, and then later on down the line, somebody um, resells that product, and I try to then stop that sale from happening. I say, I have patent rights. I can't do that because I've already sold the product that embodies the patent rights, and I've basically exhausted my rights. In this particular context, I think the theory, from what I understand um, about it, is that Apple, as I mentioned before, has actually a blanket license to a number of uh, patents that were held by this um, company called Intellectual Ventures. And so it had secured rights to the patents that in fact are being now litigated by LODSYS or LODSYS. And so the issue is, does now, and I'm not clear exactly what, if LODSYS bought or is licensing the patents from Intellectual Ventures, but does Apple's license then cover the other um, uses of the patent by its own developers. And so there are a couple kind of steps in that logic which I think are need the clarification. But the basic idea is that you can't use this patent. If you've already sold it, right, they've already sold the rights to, to Apple by making Apple take a license, then that license should cover then the actions of the people Apple's working with. Great. Um, the last question I'm going to quickly raise um, and then say thank yous and goodbyes is we've seen a real uptick in a lot of these types of suits and in patent troll suits generally. And I just am kind of curious to get everyone's opinion on if you see any long-term solutions to this problem or, you know, if there's anything to make you feel hopeful that, that maybe this problem of innovators being targeted by patent trolls might go away anytime soon or what people can do if you have any ideas about that too. So if anyone wants to take that. I have two quick comments on that. One is, so patent trolls, as Colleen mentioned, it's kind of a kind of a nasty term. I mean, in a lot of ways, patent trolls provide value. They create a market and they monetize and create a liquid environment for inventions. There are a lot of people who are innovating who then don't have the ability to take their product to market or who don't have the ability to stand up to someone infringing their patent. And so they can sell their patent or license their patent or have any kind of arrangement with someone who's willing to enforce it. And it actually benefits everyone. Has the pendulum gone too far? Yes, absolutely. Um, Very quickly on the second issue of whether or not there are things that give me hope. um, Well, quite recently, the Eastern District of Texas has started to pass particularly Judge Davis, um, has started to issue a number of orders that are defendant friendly. They have said, they call it the Hobson's choice, right? That's what the judge called it, meaning you may know that you don't infringe a patent or the patent is bogus, but it's gonna cost you a million dollars to prove it and the plaintiff is asking for 10,000, so, and they're asking for 10,000 from 1,000 defendants. And so what the courts have done in those circumstances is started to restructure the procedural rules to allow the escape hatch to be reached sooner. So you don't have to spend a million dollars to test the validity. They'll restructure it, give you something called a Markman order in a first month or a summary judgment motion very quickly. And so it's not that I expect anyone to fully understand those orders or that those orders in and of themselves solve the problem. But the point is the court 
in the district that seems to be most egregious in this regard is starting to take notice that there's a problem and reel it back in. So I find that encouraging. I think I'm, I'm actually uh, feeling more optimistic uh, because I, I think that the work of um, Julie and others to bring public attention to this issue has really raised the profile of um, the patent troll problem. And I think recently we've had mainstream press from the Wall Street Journal to The Economist to others calling for really a, a scrutiny on the patent system that we haven't seen really ever, at least um, in my, you know, time in patent law. And I think historically it's really been a new thing. So um, I do, th I do ex ex I'm interested in how that public scrutiny is going to play out. And I think there's a lot of pressure on change. Well, the thing I think that's hard about changing the patent system is that, um, you know, you've got the, the judiciary who's also pretty well aware of the issues, um, but they can only do so much. Then you've got Congress. And uh, in the current patent reform bills, they haven't been able to kind of affect the change that um, some people wanted. But this is, again, because we don't have a, we have this unitary system so that if you make changes to fix the troll issue, then you might create problems in other areas. And I still think there are, there are some, area, some kinds of changes out there that would um, be facially neutral but actually technology-specific in application. And one is the prior user rights defense. And this is one that I'm pretty interested in thinking about more in saying that if you application developers um, did your uh, – came up with your technology, um, and uh, you know, it, it might be difficult, um, you know, for individual. It might not solve the problem for everybody. But if, if companies were were doing things and they independently invented them, they didn't have any knowledge of the patent, and they did it before the patent actually was filed, then they should have immunity. So um, there are ways that we can think about and realize that invention isn't anymore this kind of idea of a single person coming with a, with an idea by themselves, but simultaneously a lot of people thinking about and coming up with great ideas. And we don't really want to punish that anymore, and we want to try to. Um, create enough room that people can can have that their space. So I think that's a kind of challenge for the lawyers and for the politicians. And, um, you know, maybe I'm naive to think that that is something that can happen. But I do think that there's more momentum and an understanding that this is something that's really um, not helpful, um, not only to, I guess, small, uh, small um, you know, developers, but also the big companies realize it as well. And so I think a lot of um, forces are interested in change and will continue to press for it. Yeah. Uh, just to follow up on some of what was said, you know, I too think you know the courts are very, they're slow. I mean, moving the law is it's like taking a huge tanker and trying to get it to do a sharp right turn. It just doesn't happen. It happens very slowly. But there are indications, you know, that the courts are aware of the problem. And I mean, there have been decisions over recent years that have addressed some of the issues. I mean, it used to be that you know you got an injunction almost as a matter of right in patent cases. And the courts looked at the fact that all of these cases were really just about money, and they changed the standards for getting a preliminary injunction to make it a little bit easier on defendants to keep on fighting. Uh, likewise, you know, the tests for obviousness used to be very rigid uh, and make it very hard to win on obviousness. And then the Supreme Court came in and changed that so that there was, you know, it was a little bit easier for defendants to invalidate patents. Uh, and, you know, there are other decisions along these lines. I mean, there was the, was it the 25% rule Unilock. on royalty rates that recently the Federal Circuit came in and got rid of that and said that it was basically just completely unfounded. Uh, and there's been the push to make it easier to get um, forum changes to transfer cases out of the Eastern District of Texas. Um, one thing that I'm a little curious to see what will happen as a re result of, um, there were some NPE-oriented provisions in the recent Patent Reform Act, most of which were taken out. One that was actually left in, mostly I think because it just wasn't on anybody's radar, is a, a non-joinder provision. So it's now going to be the case, unless it was taken out of the act unbeknownst to me, that unless the patentee is actually um, suing two parties on the exact same product, that they're not going to be able to join them in a single case uh, unless they have the uh, consent of the defendants. Uh, and so what that's going to do as a practical matter is every time there's a venue choice argument, instead of it being a case where you have 40 defendants from all over the country and, and the patentee says, hey, you know, everybody's all over the place. The Eastern District is as good a place as any. May as well have it here. It's now always going to be a one-on-one -on -one comparison, in theory at least, 
between the patentee and the defendant, and so that could result in a lot more of foreign transfers. But you know, I don't know. I mean, maybe my read of that portion of the act is uh, will not actually be played out. So. I'll just add that you know, I, I deal, I'm Andre by the way, I deal a lot with the patent office and to the extent there is a solution to this problem, I'm not sure the patent office is the right place to look for that solution. I mean, I have a lot of sympathy for the patent office within the constraints they, they work with. They actually do a good job. That's my opinion. Um, you know, you look at litigation budgets versus prosecution budgets, you know, the, the time that examiners have versus the time that litigators have. The, the ratio between the patents that are economically important versus and, and end up being litigated versus the number of patents filed overall. Mark Lemley from Stanford wrote this article, I think it was called Rational Ignorance or something, and, and he said basically it's, it's, it would be way more expensive to try to bulletproof every single patent that issues than to try to fix the problem once you know which ones are important. And perhaps the PTO can speed up reexaminations. You know, that's that's hard to do. There are a lot of problems with with trying to find the solution in the PTO. I think the solution, to the extent that, that one comes, will have to come from the courts. Put some, have the NPEs have some downside risk. You know, the rest of the world has loser loser pays. Uh, the United States is the only one, pretty much, that allows this, uh, lawsuits so easily. Maybe put some limits on discovery. Uh, re reduce the um, reduce this kind of the cost of the holdup for for defendants. I don't know. Litigators perhaps will figure out how to do it, but that's where I would look for a solution. Well, let me say, I wish you guys were all in charge and could implement those changes. Um, thanks, everyone, so much. Thank you, participants. Thank you so much, panelists. Um, I think this was a really helpful conversation. I'm sorry we couldn't answer all of your questions. Uh, many of them. You know, we're a little too specific for this type of panel. And again, if you have specific questions about your app or about a particular license provision, it might make sense for you to talk to a lawyer. Uh, and if, if you're curious about that, you should email info at EFF.org. If you are a lawyer who's uh, perhaps willing to help out in some of these cases, you can also go ahead and email info at EFF.org or me at Julie at EFF.org. Um, and, you know, hopefully we'll be able to find some lawyers who, who might be able to help you out for maybe even a lower rate or something like that. So, again, thank you, everyone, and um, I hope that, that everyone enjoyed this as much as I